So welcome to the class, Perfecting Your Pitch. This isn't your baseball pitch. This is your pitch in terms of how you communicate who you are, what you do, and also learning what other people are and what they do. And my name is Eric Horwitz. I'm the head career coach in the Career Coaching Network, which is a uh, group of people that provide coaching services to Columbia alumni. I'm here with my colleagues, Caroline and Sasha. And we're going to really have a very interactive, exciting, interesting, challenging day. Perfecting your pitch or giving a pitch is usually something that creates a lot of anxiety with people when you first meet other people. So hopefully we're really going to get to the next level on that. So we're going to kick it off with Carolyn. So my name is Caroline Sinisa Levian, and if you've never done one of these visual maps for your background, I would suggest that you uh, think about doing that. I think it's a fun way of getting everything on paper. I always use a visual uh, before I do a talk rather than some bullet points to give you an idea. So I went to Barnard College for undergrad, music and economics. I still teach at Barnard salary negotiation and also professional development at SEPA and work with an executive education program with the B School. So I'm still very involved with Columbia. And my story is that I had a pretty traditional background, Goldman Sachs, Oliver Wyman, uh, banking, and then moved into HR. And that's where I really started uh, working on coaching issues, uh, recruiting, um, and now uh, coaching as a partner at an executive coaching firm. And I've worked with people, and you can see the different logos in media, technology, and financial services. And then I also write for Forbes and appear in the media. So I think about career issues also from that perspective. Um, and Costa Rica Fire is actually a new business that I launched this year around real estate. So thinking about all the different things that you do um, and putting it all on a map and thinking about uh, what are the brand names that are there? What are the themes that are there? What are their different patterns? I think is super helpful. But that's me. What about you? So I love to hear, and I'm sure the panel would like to hear, just what your questions are about pitching. So if we could just get a handful of folks, and this is actually not Q&A, it's just the Q part. We'll do the A part afterwards. But I'd love to know more about the audience and what is your most pressing question about the pitch? No, we didn't come with any pressing, yes. Brevity, Brevity. how to do that 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Yeah, great question. How do you say everything across a 25 year career in 20 to 30 seconds? Yeah. How do you make your pitch sound not rehearsed? Whether it's 25 years, really, or even 25 months, right? How do you not sound rehearsed when you pitch? Yeah. Sound confident, but not too rehearsed, right? So we've got brevity. We've got that rehearsal issue. Yeah. Synthesize into a coherent impact. Yeah, that's a very popular question, absolutely. One more, anybody else? A how do you make it compelling, right? So we, we've talked about how do you make it brief? How do you sound confident and not too rehearsed? How do you make it coherent and how do you make it compelling? I think those are definitely some of the most popular questions. You know, I always like to open with questions, not only for me as a speaker to get to know the audience, but also I think it's a great learning tool. So it's something to think about when you go into a talk, to think about what are you there to learn? What's your most pressing question? You'll listen better for the answer. So let's do more about your story. So we're gonna jump right in and do some pitch work. If you are not sitting next to anyone, sit next to someone, because we do this in a partner way. And then also, if you're sitting next to someone that you already know, go find someone else. So please find someone that you will do a pitch exercise with. And if you don't have anyone next to you, please raise your hand so we can quickly put people together. Does anyone not have a partner? Please raise your hand so we can get you a partner. 
This is a three-part exercise, and by the end of this, you're going to have a new BFF. <laughs> so I'm going to give an instruction. One person will go, and then I'll say switch. The second person will go, then I'll say switch. Then I'll call time, give the second instruction. You alternate, you see how this works. Give a third instruction, okay, great. We're all Columbia alums, right? So we're all so smart and so good at this kind of stuff. All right, so decide who goes first by whose birthday, not the year, the day is closest to January 1st. So if you're January 1st, you're going first. If you're December 31st, going second. If you can hear my voice, say shh. Great. So we know who's going first, correct? Yes? All right. So we're going to pitch each other. 20 seconds. This time, you're going to introduce yourself to your partner. You're going to focus on your professional history. So this is typically the pitch that you're going to give at a conference or at a career fair. 20 seconds, work experience, education, go. And switch, second person goes. And time, if you can hear my voice, say shh. Great. So I told you this is a three-part exercise, so in the second part, you are going to reintroduce yourself to your partner. You cannot say anything that you said before. This time, I'd like you to focus on your personal history, where you grew up. Do you have any brothers and sisters? Your personal story, 20 seconds, first person, go. And switch, second person, second person, 20 seconds. And time, if you can hear my voice, say shh. Okay, so I told you this was a three-part exercise, so we know there is something still coming. This time you're gonna reintroduce yourself to your partner. You cannot say anything that you've said before. This time I only want you to talk about yourself in terms of your likes, passions, interests, your career goals, I like, I want, I need, 20 seconds, go. <laughs> and switch, second person, 20 seconds. And time, if you can hear my voice, say shh. Okay, if you're in a new seat and you want to go back to your seat, please feel free to move back to your seat, but you might be so enamored with your new pitch partner that you don't want to leave. So there's no wrong or right answer, just show of hands. When you were giving the pitch, so you were the one who was speaking, which one felt the most comfortable to you? Uh, the first one, the professional story, again, no wrong or right answer. Oh my goodness, everybody here almost. Okay, how about the personal story? Okay, so it's pretty even there. How about the last one? Oh, so interesting for this group, I have to say. How about for the listener? When you are the one listening to the pitch and you think about just what landed for you and what you remember, uh, which one, the first one, the professional? Okay, the personal? How many folks, okay, and then the preferences and the interests and all of that. Okay, so it's an interesting mixed group. Certainly, usually I have to say, I do this exercise a lot as an icebreaker, even if I'm not talking about pitching. It just gets people to, to meet each other. And in fact, I encourage you to exchange information with your pitch partner, and I encourage you to think about, because you know so much about them now, professionally, personally, and also what would be helpful, <laughs> right? to think about you know, networking with them over the next six to 12 months, developing that relationship. At the very least, you can practice your pitches with each other. 
and certainly at the networking breaks for this event, that you think about introducing your pitch partner to other people that you meet that you feel would be helpful to them. Many times it's easier to, to listen and to look out for other folks sometimes than it is for yourself. It takes the pressure off of you, so it's a very easy way to network. Um, but the reason why I ask for the show of hands is many times when I do this exercise, it's actually less split and it's skewed a very particular way. Most people are most comfortable talking about their professional background. Sometimes it's professional and it's personal. Less so when they're talking about things that they need, things that they want. For the listener, I often hear, you know, I often see that it's skewed the exact opposite way. And even here, there are very few people who raise their hand around the professional. So something that you want to remember when you are designing your own pitch, whether it's the 20 to 30 seconds at a conference or a two to three minute that will, you will use in a tell me about yourself type of interview or networking situation where you have a little bit more time and can go in a little bit more detail, the thing that you want to remember is that the best is a blended pitch, always, that there's professional, that there's personal, and that you don't forget that it drives towards the future, what you're interested in, what you need, what would be helpful to you, so that the other person has a sense for where it is that you're going. The other thing to remember about a pitch is that we are more than what we did for a living or where we went to school. We are more than where we come from. We have you know, just unique preferences and passions and identifiers about us, and it's that blend of all three of them. It's that multi dimensional pitch that really, really lands. I've been a recruiter for over 20 years. I've heard everything, but it's the combination of everything that's really cool. Right? Meeting someone who has both an interesting background and then also a passion or a side uh, hobby doing X, Y, Z. So just something to think about. Um, and Eric and Sasha are going to do a lot more kind of detailed work around that, but I really just wanted to get your creative juices flowing. And so I have actually a printout of an article that I wrote for Forbes around pitching. So I'm going to pass that around and it has my contact information. I would love to hear from folks about how this has been helpful to you. And so I'd love to stay in touch. All right, can you hear me? I'm going to steal from her and say, if you can hear me, say shh. I used to work with kids, so I used to have them clap three times, but the shh is much quieter. So my name is Sasha McDowell. I'm an alumni of SEPA and Social Work School, and as Caroline said, I'm gonna get kind of into the nuts and bolts of how you can create a pitch and a longer value proposition. It's an activity that I do with a lot of my um, career coaching clients. So we're gonna talk through the pieces and really get into the details, and then at the end, you're gonna have a chance to practice. So. It is about integrating, really following up on what Caroline just said, it's really about integrating who you are and what you do in your pitch. So I like to have people start this process in writing. Writing can be a more comfortable place for people to start and it's a place that gives you a record. Um, and I like people to start by writing out their whole story and it's really the messy and authentic version. At the beginning it's a brain dump. It's your chance to create your most authentic version of your story. It's a brainstorming exercise so you don't need to be worried about how are you going to sound to other people you don't need to be worried at this point about what does the listener want to hear from you um, this is the piece that's the most like journaling and it's your chance to be introspective and reflect on who you were at different points in your life so because you're going to turn this into something that you use in the minute the the four minute version the one minute version and the 20 to 30 second version some people like to start by really populating on their written page these um, subcategories so they can start to just throw bullets right under these things so you really want to talk about what were some of your early interests what makes you you and these are things that have morphed into who you became as a professional and as an adult how did these interests lead to your areas of study what did you do sort of early in your career, in the middle of your career, and most recently? Obviously, you're going to include your academic background and your work history, but you also really want to hone in on your strengths, your key interests, and then stories that highlight who you are, any twists and turns in your journey, and of course, some professional successes that you've had. So combining your skills and your identity, again, really playing off of the exercise that we just did. So you want to address some key questions to weave your identity and your professional background together. 
Some of the questions you might want to think about as you're writing your story include, what are some of the talents you remember demonstrating really early in life that have carried through your adult life? So for some people, this is a very direct correlation. And they might say something like, you know, I always loved measuring and counting things as a child. In school, I excelled at math. I ended up studying economics. And I went on to become an accountant. Very linear. For other people, it might be a talent that morphed into something else. And they're saying something like, I always loved reading. As a kid, I always had a book in my hand. Um, as I got older, I became very interested in the justice system. And my ability and my passion for consuming a lot of information really let me excel in law school and in my legal career afterwards. So you're, you want to be highlighting things about yourself that have been enduring interests that have turned into your current strengths. You also want to be able to share stories about different ways you've demonstrated your strengths throughout your career so that your strengths come to life and you feel like a real person rather than just listing a laundry list of impersonal bullets. Um, and of course, you're going to weave these things in with your most relevant work experiences. So I want to share for you a value proposition um, that's, I'd say, a mid-length value proposition of a client who I worked with because I think he had a very interesting background and he was able to weave together some different pieces of himself. So what he shared was, I've always had an affinity for sports, watching and playing sports whenever I could. When I learned about the sports management in major, major in college, I knew right away that it was for me. In college, I had the opportunity to intern at the National Football League, and I was hired there after graduating. I spent about five years there running programs and working on communications. I've also always been a very detail-oriented person, and I'm a big consumer of information, and I like doing a deep dive into topics and learning everything I can about a current interest. While I really loved my time at the NFL, I wanted to also be challenged in a new way. And I happened to meet a colleague who'd been managing research projects in a library. And I decided to make an 100, 180 degree turn. And I went to graduate school for library and information studies. I loved the intellectual challenge of the work. I loved the ability to really focus on building knowledge. When I finished my master's, I wanted to bring my master's and my passion for sports together. So I went to work for a major sports publication and worked in their research library. It was a great experience learning the ropes of a specialized sports library. My next role was at NYU in the Special Collections and University Archives Department in the library. I spent 10 years in this role managing the reference desk, creating order out of sometimes very chaotic collections, and ultimately I managed the team and oversaw the library itself. I continue to see myself both as a researcher, a sports enthusiast, and also now as a supervisor. So I'm looking for a new challenge now, and I'm looking for a role back in the world of sports and library science that would let me either manage the whole team or focus on overseeing the collections. So I thought he had a really interesting background, and he was able to bring these different pieces of who he is as a person together with this sort of varied, more interesting, nonlinear background. So what is your pitch doing for you? The point of your pitch or your value proposition is, of course, to open doors. At a job interview, in a networking situation, wherever you're delivering it. So you want the listener to leave the conversation, whether it's a really short conversation or a longer conversation, with a really clear sense of what you're good at and what makes you unique. So this is, of course, going to be true if your next step is a linear one or if you're making a bit of a career shift. So you want to make sure that you can share key strengths, three, four, five, pretty concisely so they're easy for the person to remember. And you also want to be able to share some examples of situations in your professional background where you've, de where you've demonstrated the strengths. And then the pitch is also to open the next door for you, right? So you want to help people understand your current interests, what it is that you want to do right now, no matter how different these interests might seem from what you've done in the past. So sharing your background and your strengths in a clear way is going to give people the context to understand what you want to do next and why that makes sense, regardless of the kind of background you've had um, professionally. Um, and then finally, I think you really want your value proposition or your pitch to show people that you have the skills for whatever it is you want to do next, particularly if you're doing something a little bit nonlinear. Not everything has to line up A to B to C, but just what are some of those transferable skills that you've developed where it makes sense that you would want to go in this new direction. So it's your story, um, but you're always going to be telling it to many different kinds of people. So it will, of course, have some measure of consistency because it is your life. <laughs> But as we all know, your goal is to connect with your listener and share a story that feels compelling given the specifics of the situation that you're in. So once you've drafted that long form, that value proposition, and I think somebody asked that question, how do I condense 25 years into 20 to 30 seconds, which is 
difficult, which is why I tend to do this sort of as a longer exercise with people. You can take that longer version where you have everything, the professional highlights, your strengths, your interests, all of that good stuff, and then you can edit it down so you have different lengths. And I encourage people to have three different lengths. You've got the four minute version, and this version is typically used most likely in a first interview question where the interviewer is asking you something broad and something thorough, like lead me through your career um, to date, let me know your key achievements in each role, and let me know the career transitions that you, that you made and why you made them. So you're really gonna be talking through a lot of different things similar to the example that I shared. This version is gonna change the least because it's chronological um, and it's pretty thorough. And it's the version that's going to tell most like a story where you can weave in some really interesting things about yourself that make you a little bit diff different. Um, then you're going to have the one minute version. This is the version that you're going to use most often at networking events. And you can play with the format. Somebody talked about how do you not sound rehearsed. You can play with the format. If you're clear on like, I always say these five things and here's a few other things that I may or may not weave in depending on the situation. You sort of know your information but you can make it sound more conversational. So you can play with different formats. You might just have the way that you go through it and you sort of deliver it, or you might decide, I always like to share sort of 30 seconds of big picture information. The listener then asks me a couple questions and then I come back with some more specifics that I think are relevant to this conversation. This version will change some depending on the kind of event you find yourself at. And then the 20 to, second, the 20 to 30 second version, so that concentrated condensed pitch um, of course, you're going to use this if maybe you have a high-level person's ear very quickly. You might be in a situation where it's just not appropriate to sell yourself that strongly, and you might be in a casual environment where this makes more sense. Um, this version of your pitch is going to change the most because you have a very small amount of time and you're really thinking about the context of the situation you're in and what makes sense for that particular person that you're talking to, what you want to highlight. Um, and then once you know it cold, I think, you will sound less rehearsed because it will just be the, the kind of thing that you'd be telling your friend or you meet somebody out socially and you're like sort of this is what I do and it can sound a little bit more authentic. Sharing personal information. Um, so I think this is a very important part. Like many of you experienced in the earlier exercise, it's what makes people interesting. It was, it's what brings them to life. It was, it's what makes them more than just a resume or a list of accomplishments. Um, so after you've gone through this exercise where you've really thought about some old anecdotes, some things you've done in different phases of your career, things you haven't thought about in a while, you're ready to share specific stories so that the listener understands not only how you made strategic changes in your career, but also how your career decisions were sometimes influenced by personal events. So a note on sharing personal information. Um, as I said before, this is what makes you come alive. This is what makes you interesting and memorable. It makes you a real person. Um, Obviously, you're sharing things that are appropriate for a professional setting. Um, that said, people have very different comfort levels of what they want to share. So I also think that this can be a great way to gauge, particularly when you're in a job interview situation, a culture fit, deliberately sharing information to see if this is a place that you'd actually want to be at. Um, similarly, I think there's times where we all build our network a little bit more strategically and we're building it broadly. But I think that some of the best networking advice I've received is, Spend most of your time networking with people who you actually really like. Like you actually really enjoy talking to them and you're going to form deeper relationships. You're going to want to see them more often and they're going to think of you in situations more than that person who it's really just sort of like, wow, they seem smart and they're great on paper. They're still good to know and have in your network, but they might not be as useful to you as somebody who you might choose to grab a drink with. Um, so let's think for a second about sharing information at a job interview in that long value proposition. I think it can be very easy to focus on two things in a job interview. It can be very easy to get hyper-focused on your performance and how you're going to negotiate salary if an offer comes in. But I think that it's important to remember that this is a real place that you will actually have to go to and potentially for many years and you want to make sure that you like it there. So I know for me, after I feel like I'm in a further interview round and I feel like I've demonstrated some competence for the job, I actually always deliberately joke around. If it is an uptight 
very sort of by the book place, I'm just not going to be happy there. And I don't think I'm going to be able to be my best self and do my best work. So I think humor is important. For me, it doesn't negate competence. And I like working in places where there's a real focus on excellence, but people also have a good time and it feels collegial. And even though I've done that many, many times in my career, it still feels like a risk. Um, I don't want to accidentally eliminate myself. What if they're looking for this other kind of person and it's not me? But I think that it's important that I do that. And my point in sharing that is just that no matter how many times I've done it, it still always feels like a risk, even though I've done it many times and it's landed well. Um, you know, it can be scary to share things about yourself. You feel like you're opening a door a little bit and you're sort of going off script. Um, same thing with networking when you're playing it safe and you're being purely professional. I think it leaves people with a very different impression of who you are than if you show them who you really are. So as you're sort of, one of the benefits of going through and really writing this out in a long form earlier is it gives you a chance to think about what do you want to share, what do you need to share, and how are you going to do it. So I want to talk about a few specific <coughs> kinds of personal events that you might need to share in either in an interviewing situation or in a networking situation that just become a part of your pitch. So being laid off. Um, there are times where you've just bounced quickly into another job and maybe you can sort of skim over it, but there's times where you need to talk about it. Um, it's always great to show that you were able to take sort of a difficult event and make lemonade out of lemons. Um, so maybe you're highlighting that you used the time out of work to gain a new skill. Um, maybe you made a slight pivot that's a little different from what you've done in the past deliberately to develop new skills and um, gain some new knowledge. Parenting and caring for aging parents is a big one that I see with my clients. Um, sometimes you have to share this information because you have a resume gap or you've chosen to work part time. Sometimes you've turned down jobs with travel or you have not pursued certain promotions because of responsibilities at home. So you can talk about it pretty simply. This is the decision that I made. It was what was right for me and my family at the time. And then sort of go on either to highlight immediate professional successes after that, or really talk about just your excitement and your enthusiasm for jumping back in. And you're looking for X, Y, and Z based on these strengths. Um, I think also at the same time, so doing care work is very important to me and I think it's something that people shouldn't be dinged for. So I think it's another disclosure that you may opt to share because it can tell you something about the environment. Particularly if you're somebody who is still going to need a family friendly environment or you plan on negotiating for flexibility if an offer comes in. This might be something you want to throw out a little bit in your story to test the waters a little bit and see if it's going to be a good fit for you. Um, and then finally you might want to share some personal information that makes you interesting and explains your story about you took a specific job because it allowed you to live abroad or travel frequently and that it fulfilled per personal interests as well as um, allowed you to grow as a professional. All right, so your pitch is meant to open doors. Whatever situation you find yourself in and you're looking to make that next step, you want your pitch to help you open that door. Sometimes it's a really big door like a job interview and it needs your whole value proposition. Um, sometimes you're using your pitch to try to get a meeting or an introduction with somebody else or you're just meeting somebody new and you have no idea where the conversation is going to take you. So ideally you want your pitch to answer questions that the listener might have ideally before they ask them. So if you're networking for a job or you're interviewing, you want your pitch to already let the listener know why are you a fit for this kind of job? How did your background pre prepare you with the skills that you would need for this kind of job? And then for networking conversations, you want to show how your strengths, your interests, and your professional history are all aligned with this next step. So now we're going to practice. So don't worry about reading all this stuff. You can refer back to it. I'm going to sort of tell you what we're going to do. Then you're going to find a partner. And then I'll give you prompts um, as you're doing it. So you're going to find a different partner. Um, and I think we had an odd number. So somebody will partner with Abby. Um, you're going to dig around and find that free notebook and pen that they hopefully gave you upstairs and you're going to jot down some chronological bullets that really make sure that you're addressing your talents, your interests, and your strengths, and of course professional highlights. Then you're going to pitch your, pitch your partner. But before you pitch your partner, I'm losing some of you. Don't, don't let me lose you yet. Before you pitch your partner, you want to give them the context of this pitch. Are you in a job interview? Are you networking for a job with this pitch? Are you just going upstairs to the next event and you're talking to somebody in the headshot line? Like, what's the context for this pitch? Then you're going to give them the pitch. They're going to give you about 20 seconds of feedback. Um, maybe ask for, since people don't like to say critical things, but 
critical things delivered in a kind way can actually be helpful. Maybe you ask them for two things they liked and one or two things that weren't as clear to them. Then you're going to swap, okay? And my last piece of advice before you find a partner is this is a chance to experiment. So if you know that you're somebody who actually gives a really great pitch, but it's very like, first I went to Columbia, and then I was in the Honor Society, and then I got hired for every job, like, use it as a chance to experiment and share some more personal information. Um, just use it as a chance to do something that you don't usually do so you can practice in this setting. Any questions? All right. Find a different partner. Oh, hi. So, okay. All right. If you have not already, actually, if you can hear my voice, say shh. If you can hear my voice, say shh. All right. If you haven't already, you are now going to pitch your partner no more than 30 seconds, and then you're going to ask for a few points of feedback at the end. All right? All right. That is it. We're done. If you can hear my voice, say shh. If you can hear my voice, say shh. All right. So, a couple last things to summarize. Your pitch is going to be constantly evolving depending on where you are in your career and what door you want to open next. That's fine. And some best practices, write it down. Be deliberate in sharing talents, interests, and strengths. Craft different versions for different scenarios. And balance authenticity with tailoring for your audience. Thank you, guys, and good luck. OK, now we're on the final little training we're going to be doing. And I'll just tell you a little bit about me. That's a picture of me. Um, <laughs> okay, so my background, and pay attention because this is like a pitch, is I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I went to Columbia University 1986 to 1990. I ran the Hartley Kosher Deli. Yeah, so if you needed corned beef that was semi-fresh, came over to me. <laughs> Uh, I worked in corporate America for 13 years uh, in HR. I managed 400 people. I decided to become a coach in 2005. Been an executive coach for 13 years. And I've been running the Columbia Coaching Network for the last five. And um, what I'm working on now is I work with people in finance, with people in fashion, all different industries in terms of executive coaching and group coaching as well. And uh, the ways I help is I help uh, identify coaches that uh, we offer to Columbia alumni. And I'm an executive coach myself. And I do a lot of things in groups as well as individually. Okay, so the second half of what we're learning today is the art of listening, okay? And so it's all great that we've learned how to talk, but the harder, sorry. The harder thing is how to listen, okay? So the main thing that I want to say here, first of all, is that listening is not a science, it's an art. So what I'm teaching you today is, is nuanced, every situation is different, people understand it differently, people listen differently, so you can take all the notes that you want, but this is like learning to be a painter, okay? So. Here's a nice little Ernest Hemingway quote. When people talk, listen completely. Most people never listen. So this is something that we all learn in coaching school, which is learning how to listen. And so the, the point is, is, it is a very rare skill. And you will find that people that are great listeners are the people that are most, they are the most successful in terms of how they interact with others. They attract other people to them, okay, because most people like to talk, right? Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do a little practice thing. It's, okay. So, first of all, turn off your phone, hide your phone, get rid of your phone. Okay. So sit up straight. Okay. Make eye contact just with me. Okay. Quiet your mind. 
Now, every time you have a thought, I want you to picture the thought as though it's a book in the library. So the, the thought's gonna come into your head like a book in the library. You take the book and you put the book on the shelf. Okay, we're gonna see how long we can just be quiet. If somebody could time this, that would be awesome. Okay, how long was that? That was 10 seconds, okay? How long did that feel like? Anyone wanna throw out how long that felt like? A long time, okay? In coaching school, part of the thing they make you do is learn for 90, to listen or be quiet for 90 seconds. So ask someone a question, what do you wanna do with your life? And then be quiet for 90 seconds. And you saw what 10 seconds of being quiet and being present seemed like an hour. Okay, so that's, so again, this is like an art and it's a skill, it's something you learn and just to get 10 seconds is, is a challenge. And the other thing is not thinking during that time, okay? That's why I gave you the kind of the tip. When you have a thought, think of the thought like it's a book. Look at the book for a second, put the book away. Guess what's gonna happen? Another thought's gonna come. Take the thought, put it away. There you go. Okay. So now I'm going to teach you some definitions that we're going to learn like we're learning in school. So now you can take notes, but this is so, sort of the basics that you want to learn when you're learning about how to listen. Okay. So these are just concepts. So concept number one is a symptom. So a symptom is a clue to a deeper point. So what's a symptom when you're, you're listening to someone? Well, they talk really fast. Okay. What does that mean? Maybe they're nervous, maybe they're lying, okay? Maybe, yeah, maybe. They're lying, okay, we got a journalist here, it's a lie, if you're talking fast, you're lying, okay? So, so all the thing when you're listening is, you're not judging, you're, you're seeing a symptom. Oh, they're talking fast, that's interesting, okay? So that's what a symptom is. Context, so what is the situation in which this event is occurring? Okay, right now we're in, a we're in a class, we're at a, a networking thing, we're at a place where there are other alumni, we all went to the same school, but I don't know any of you, okay? So it can be both intimate, but it can also be uncomfortable, okay? So understanding when you're listening to someone in what context that you are receiving the information, okay? Number three, intuition. So what is intuition? Intuition is the merger of facts and experience. So every experience that you've had for your whole life, you've all got it all tracked in there and it's all being added up, okay? So when you're listening, if your intuition, which is the energy you're feeling in the interaction, is telling you something, even though the facts may not align with that, trust your intuition. Intuition is lots and lots of data all put together. Okay? And a lot of times when you're listening to somebody, you know, something they say, you're like, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. It's probably not right. Okay. Okay. Reflection, which is matching the communication style of the other person. So as you're listening to someone, if they're a fast talker, talk fast. If they're a slow talker, talk slower. Okay. So the idea is to, to integrate communication between two people and to be a good listener is to match the communication style. A lot of times people don't do that, okay? And in doing that, you get more openness from the, the individual who's talking when you talk. Okay, so more definitions, which I just said. So number one is track, match energy to energy. If you're a high energy person and you start talking to a low energy person, that conversation is gonna get really short, okay? <laughs> All right, next thing is to listen for values, okay? So val here's an example of values. You probably learned it at some point in school. Truth is a value. Beauty is a value. Kindness is a value. When people talk, they tell you what they value. And what we learned in the world, in the world of coaching is people are first in life motivated by their values. If they live according to their values, then they get their needs met. And the needs include 
a home, and food. And if you get your needs met, then you get your wants, like your new car and your fancy house and the country, okay? But if you don't have your values met, nothing else matters, okay? So the idea is when listening, listening for value words, okay? The next thing is, as I said, is needs, which are emotional needs, their physical needs. So listening when someone talks to be able to distinguish between what is a value and what is a need. And then thirdly, a want, a wish, a desire. Okay, and, and Caroline, we did some good exercises there to be able to tease out in a conversation what people value, what they want, and what they need. So it's not just enough to listen, because now what I'm showing you is we're listening for different pieces in terms of a, commu in a communication. Okay, so now I'm gonna make some more, maybe this is more of a distinction, okay. So hearing is just a, is, is a physical thing, okay? So I'm hearing you. Listening is a skill that you learn, okay? So just standing and having someone talking is, is and, and that taking in that information is hearing, but being able to listen is a different skill, which I'm starting to show you how to do. Okay, attention is something we give. So it's sort of like the exercise that I just did with you guys, which is that's learning to be attentive, okay? And it's something when listening to someone that you share, something you share, okay? Now, in 1972, I think attention was a lot easier because you didn't carry around a phone which had seven billion people able to access you in a minute, okay? And the news sharing every drama that's happening at every minute. So giving attention is an amazing gift. And if you can get to the art of attention, then you get to the art of listening. So that's, that's something to think about whenever you are communicating with someone. I have, a, I have two millennial children and they get mad when I don't pick up the phone when they call. And I'm like, well, because I'm giving someone else attention. And that just seems baffling that you could be just focused on one person for, 30 seconds, okay, <laughs> there you go, all right, there. okay, so gist, so the gist is what's the general theme, getting a sense of kind of like, what's sort of happening here, I'm talking to this person, they're looking around, they don't seem all that interested, or they seem very focused, so just like we talked about context of what you're in, what's the gist of the conversation, and where we've talked to a lot about how to speak, the point is we want it to be articulate and short enough, so you get the gist really right away. Okay, but if you're a good listener, someone could talk for like 40 minutes and what you just want to understand is what's the gist. And then another great way to be a good listener is two things, actually, I didn't list both of them, but parroting and paraphrasing. So parroting is, you say to me, it's such a beautiful day. So parroting, I go, it's such a beautiful day, okay? Paraphrasing would be, it's, it's such a beautiful day, and then I say, Wow, it seems like you really like good weather, okay? So when listening, the act of then talking back to the person, repeating what they say, either exactly or within, you know, with a paraphrase, helps you to be a better listener because the act of saying it yourself again will then make you hear it better, okay? So these are some good definitions that you now learn in Listening 101, okay? So then here's just some good concepts to, to think about. Number one, what is not said is as interesting as what's said. It is often true, like if someone got laid off from a job and they're giving a conversation about what's going on, they're generally potentially gonna kinda weave their way out of that because it's, it's a difficult thing to communicate. Knowing what to listen for is very helpful for a conversation. Like I said, wants, needs, desires. So listen for those key words. Okay, and then the silent act of listening allows you to get more information. Okay, so when you're so busy talking, you're not getting more information. And therefore, you don't know how to communicate back because you don't know what's important to the other person. Okay, this one's a hard one in our political climate, which is listen even if you don't agree. Okay, so that again, it goes back to being still. You're, someone's gonna say something and you're like, oh my God, I hate you, I wanna never talk to you again. But I'm gonna listen, okay? So listen even if you disagree. 
Okay, then the other thing is, remember there's all that chatter in your head? Most people are not listening because they're thinking in their head, oh, I really hope this person likes me. I'm really, really, really important person to know, but it doesn't matter. So a good listener does not spend all the time thinking about themselves and how they're gonna validate themselves to, to prove something, okay? Then the other really important thing, and this is something that we also do in coaching, is take one fact from the conversation and lodge that in your memory. So if you talk to someone for 30 minutes, just say, I spoke to Susan and she really likes horses. Okay, from the whole 30 minutes. But the point is, is our brains cannot capture all that information. So whenever having a conversation, just try to take one thing, okay? Personal information makes things much more memorable. I'm working right now with a client and she wants to be, everything she says, she wants to be so professional, she never wants to share any personal information. If you try to find her on Facebook, you can't find her, it's all very private. I got her to tell me that she grew up in Wildwood, New Jersey, okay? My father was born in Wildwood, New Jersey, okay? So it's like a total little nuance. It doesn't really mean anything, but we're gonna remember that conversation and now we have some sort of connection. So you never know what piece of personal information is really going to be valuable. Maybe one of you had a corned beef sandwich at my Hartley Kosher Deli. Okay. And it's really okay to repeat. Sometimes people talk too fast. So you can say, hey, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Can you repeat it? Okay. Again, it comes down to stillness. Okay. So then we talked a little bit about, this is really a hard skill because we have a lot of brain chatter. And generally, because I coach a lot of individuals have gone to schools like Columbia or Harvard, there's a lot of extra thoughts, okay? You guys have more thoughts than most people. <laughs> so I always advise, there's a lot of great meditation apps. Get a meditation app. A meditation app will start to teach you the skill of cutting down on the chatter. Okay, like I said, learn how to put the books away. Then I have a rule. They are, most people are not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves, okay? So don't worry about it, okay? And then finally, become aware of your own reactions, your body language, how you're holding your hands. If someone says something that you disagree with, you will stop listening right then. So really feel your sort of physical presence when someone's talking to you to understand what you're telegraphing and whether you're being able to listen. Okay. All right, we got one more exercise, but this time we're gonna do this task in groups of three instead of two, okay? So you're gonna do the same exercise in terms of communicating with someone to, to business, you know, things about you and one personal. A third person is going to be the observer of this communication, okay? And the goal is, is for the listener to repeat back what they heard. And if the listener can get all three, you know, all three points correct, we don't have prizes, but we'll be really proud of you. And that's <laughs> got to count for something. Um, Okay, so work in groups of three. One's the talker, one's the listener, one's the observer, and the goal is for the listener to be able to repeat back the three points, if possible. If you can't, look, it's your first class. Don't, don't be hard on yourself. Okay, go ahead. Okay, good. All right, if, okay, let's, let's get back together. If you were able to hear and repeat everything that the speaker said, please stand up. Okay, pretty good. Very good, clap for the listeners, okay? Listeners deserve respect. Okay, great, you can sit down now. Okay. So does anyone want to say, as a listener, what, w what was hard about it or what, what was helpful? Yes, you have some? The noise in the room was made it harder, right? So think about when you're listening to people, oftentimes there's a lot of distraction, 
Okay, that's a good point. Anyone else as a listener, a challenge? As a listener, yes? Got it, right? Like, so what were you thinking while the person was talking? <laughs> right, right. You were th maybe thinking, oh, Eric gave us this assignment and we gotta do good at it and I gotta listen and what if I don't listen right and what if I don't get to stand up, right? Okay, so the thing is, this is so hard when you're listening to not be thinking about what you're gonna say next and especially you with my Ivy League friends to show how smart you are after you heard what the other person said, okay? It's okay, you can get a C in talking and a B in listening. Okay, good. All right, so now we're gonna do a little bit of recap of the whole session, and then we're gonna, take, we're gonna go back to the questions that we had in the beginning and see if we can get them answered. Okay, so uh, who wants to share something that you learned from everything we talked about today? Yes. Hello, I'm Gloria. Something that resonated with me that I learned here today was jotting down the facts that will help with your value proposition. I did it here and it was very helpful and I look forward to doing more of it. Okay, who else wants to share something? Yes. Hi, I'm Rudy. What I really learned is the value of listening. I think more, more times people are talking or thinking of something else as opposed to receiving whatever the information is that's being directed toward them. Okay, yes. I was struck by the slide that focused on li listening for values, that we're not just listening for content, mm -hmm. but when you can resonate with what that person values, you're likely to be able to make a stronger connection with them and build on that. Thank you. That's great, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Brian. Um, I learned that some of the strongest pitches aren't just uh, pitches that talk about your professional experience, but also your personal life and what you're passionate Okay. Who wants to share something that you w retain, meaning one thing you're not going to forget from what you learned today? Who wants to share something you'll stop doing? We're talking about what you're going to start doing. Yes, what are you going to stop doing? Well, um, I agree with all your um, comments. And what I would stop doing is feeling very uncomfortable about talking about myself because it is a Caroline Avant said that um, if you don't feel like you're bragging, you have a problem understanding yourself. So I would stop to the setting. That's a great one. Okay. Anyone else want to say something they're going to stop doing? Yes. Um, in interviews, especially um, in academia, I'm going to stop focusing on Performance and really integrating personal, more authentic conversation because it's very important for your environment. Yes. So, so what's great about that is people mostly want to just work with people they like, so they don't care so much about like your classes you took or anything like that. I w I'm going to see you most of the day. I got to like you. And when I like you, I want to know what's going on with your life. Okay, great. Okay, so then Caroline, we're going to go back to the questions we had and let's. Yeah, yes. so I, I mean, I just have a, a comment about it, because the questions were, you know, how do I be, how do I sound confident without being rehearsed, coherent, compelling, how do I, I put everything in? I just want to remind everyone, if you remember, uh, you know, in the exercise when I asked for a poll at the end, you know, what did you feel comfortable giving, and then as the listener, what did you feel good about listening to, there was definitely a skew where, very few people really just wanted to focus only on the, the professional as the listener. And when you think about your pitch, it's the listener really who determines whether or not the pitch lands or whether it resonates. And so it's just something to think about. Find your pitch partner from the couple of exercises and ask them what did they remember, what really landed for them, because you can use that uh, to build on. And, and to the person who asked about, you know, 25 years in, in 20 seconds, just remember that you're not getting hired from your pitch. You're not even getting necessarily an interview from your pitch. You are trying to make a connection and then to talk further. So you don't have to close the deal here, right? It's not about everything. I didn't introduce myself as being married with two kids. That's still true, 
It's just that it wasn't as relevant here because I'm talking to Columbia alums and so I opened with, hey, I went to Barnard and teach at SIPA, right? But if I was talking to women entrepreneurs, I would say, hey, I run two businesses, one with a, a friend from college and another with my husband and I have two kids and I'm married, right? And these don't make them any less true. So just remember that, that you can omit things and it's not a sin of omission there. All right, so I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hopefully you learned a lot. <laughs>